Hello, my name is Martin Durkin. I'm a television producer and I am hosting what I think will be um, one of the most important sessions um, uh, 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 in this um, a wonderful jamboree, uh, which is about the future of so-called public service broadcasting in the UK. Um, I have a stellar um, uh, um, lineup of panelists, but I want to kick off before I introduce them with a, a, um, a little fact to tease you. Um, in 2015, uh, 2015 uh, Roger Mosey, Mosey, the former head of um, BBC Television News, said the BBC estimated it had a market share of 70% of news consumption on both British TV and radio. 70%, that's what economists call a monopoly. That means that um, in subtle and in not so subtle ways, the BBC is able to uh, colour and skew public discourse on a wide variety of subjects like Brexit and global warming, uh, austerity versus taxation, the NHS and so on. Um, is this right? Should we be angry about it? Is it right that, that at the beginning of the 21st century, the state is providing us with the information that we need via broadcasting? So to talk about it, we have Philip Booth, who is, a, uh, who is the senior academic fellow at the Institute of Economic Affairs and professor of finance, public policy, mm -hmm. ethics at St. Mary's University. In fact, Philip has so many professorships and has written so many books on so many things that if I listed them all, it would take a full hour. Um, so just to summarize, he's got an enormous brain and is a brilliant economist. We have Ben Bradley, MP for Mansfield. Uh, ben is chair of my favorite particular bit of the conservative um, uh, uh, machine, blue collar conservatives, um, uh, uh, demonstrating that perhaps that uh, the conservative party is the new home for the British working class, at least as long as Nigel Farage stays out of politics. Um, we have Duncan Simpson, um, who's research director of the Taxpayers Alliance. When Duncan published The Large Salaries of Trade Union Leaders, the RMT leader, appropriately named Mick Cash, attacked the TPA as a shadowy right-wing cabal, which makes it sound a hell of a lot more exotic than it really is. Um, uh, he was parliamentary assistant to Douglas Carswell. Uh, and we have the Right Honourable John Whittingdale OBE. He was culture secretary till he committed the crime of being one of just six cabinet ministers to come out in support of Brexit. Um, but he's still a minister in the Department of Department of Culture, Media and Sport, so he has to watch his P's and Q's. Um, he also holds the Order of Merit of Ukraine, third class, which uh, uh, there is a full hour of discussion there, but we'll have to skip the house. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to ask each of the panelists to kick off um, with a, a, a three minute chat about uh, the subject, starting with Philip Booth. OK, thank you very much, uh, Martin. Well, my position is quite simple, that funding the BBC by a levy on a particular device which can be used for a variety of functions, regardless of whether that device is actually used to watch the broadcaster that the levy funds, is no longer tenable. It's also, I should say, I don't think morally tenable, and it must not survive um, the next charter review. Now, if this system is replaced, as many would want it to be replaced, by funding the BBC by a general tax, or for example, a tax on uh, broadband, um, if that happens, I think the BBC is doomed to decline, as it will become uh, a government corporation which will have all the constraints of a government uh, corporation. It will be starved of capital, limited in its commercial uh, partnerships, and will not be able to exploit the potential um, of innovation. It will also become um, a political football because it will become directly funded um, by the state. And in fact, we know that um, this is the likely path to the BBC uh, if we go down that route of uh, finding some other tax to, to fund it. Because there are many Conservative MPs already calling um, for the BBC to be slimmed down just to perform core functions, et cetera, et cetera. I actually want the BBC to thrive, and I think that the BBC can only thrive if it's funded by people who actually want to pay for it and want to avail themselves uh, of, the, of its services. So I think the BBC should be funded by subscription, um, there's no justification in the modern world for requiring people to pay for television services they don't wish to watch. So this then leads to the question of the ownership of the BBC. Now, even if politicians thought a commercial sale of the BBC desirable, I don't think it's on the table. And I think we should probably consider something else. In a thriving free economy, especially in the arts, education, culture, media and so on, we see a wide variety of forms of ownership, a mutual and cooperative forms of ownership uh, are quite common. Um, they often actually provide the right kind of environment for um, people to be creative and for commercial and artistic freedom. So I think there's a very strong case for turning the BBC 
um, into a um, subscriber-owned mutual. In other words, a company which is owned by people who wish to subscribe uh, to its services. Uh, a BBC which was so structured would be free to develop any commercial partnerships that it wished and also to expand its services to the 95% of the English speaking world that actually lives outside the, the United Kingdom. And it could do that through joint ventures, wholly owned subsidiaries, uh, and so on. I just want to make one further point because we've only got three minutes. David Clementi has said, uh, and, and others actually, that if we move to a subscription model, the BBC will only produce things that the middle class want to watch. Other people um, say that uh, if we move to a subscription model and, and the market for broadcasting, uh, then the market will only produce junk food. Um, I'm quite sure, in fact, that um, neither of these positions um, are consistent with each other, and I don't think either of these uh, positions uh, are, are correct. There is a remarkable amount of content, uh, uh, great content out there produced by free market broadcasters and also by the BBC, and nobody has yet given me a convincing reason why the BBC will not um, continue to produce uh, great content if it is funded by people who wish to fund it and wish to subscribe. Thank you very much. I forgot to unmute myself. <laughs> um, thank you, Philip. And um, Ben, can we uh, uh, hear from you, please? <clears throat> uh, you have to unmute yourself. We'll get there in the end. Just check that everybody can hear me because my, my internet dropped out at just the worst possible time there. Um, yeah, we can. You're crystal clear. Yeah, great. Um, perfect. So um, thanks for having me this morning. Uh, fundamentally, I come from the position that I just do not see in the 21st century, when we have so much choice in our, our media output, why and how it can be justified for the taxpayer to continue to subsidise uh, a media platform. And, and um, you know, it made sense in the 40s and the 50s when there were very few other options there. And if you did want to get news out there, if you wanted to get a message out um, for, in the kind of public interest, then that was the only way to do it. But these days we've got millions of choices and we've seen doesn't speak. So in many ways, it's just being out competed. And I think a lot of that is due to the limitations of being a public service broadcaster. Um, I'd make the same argument about Channel 4, by the way. I just do not see um, the reason why the taxpayer should be funding any media whatsoever, given the choice that we all have. Um, there are examples of where uh, the BBC aren't making the most of the opportunities that they've got, in my view, in, particularly in terms of that free market and that competition, we've seen, um, you know, the uh, reluctance, it seems, to, to market kind of iPlayer and to monetize that or to, to take advantage of an international audience. Maybe that's something that the BritBox platform might aim to do, but then you've got these two platforms competing against each other potentially or having to fold one into the other. Um, it hasn't been done, it seems to me, in a sensible way. But the biggest argument that we have across all of these state broadcasters is, is typically around bias and is around uh, both Channel 4 and the BBC accusations of, of uh, the way that they go about covering news and government in particular. I'm, I'm of the view that I don't think anybody there is, is deliberately biased, or certainly not the vast majority, but I do think there is a, a kind of groupthink mentality, people largely of um, similar backgrounds, similar um, uh, you know, social circumstances, largely in metropolitan areas that do have a certain view of the world. And I think almost... Um, by accident, probably the wrong, wrong phrase, but uh, because all those people are working together on that content, uh, I think they're in many cases making bad judgments about what is reflective of the country at large. Um, actually, the least represented group uh, it, at these uh, public service broadcasters is probably, you know, young working class lads from the northeast. I don't see many of them uh, on our, our national content, particularly when it comes to news. Um, so I think they have some priorities wrong there in terms of a message, in terms of diversity, uh, taking money away from those local and regional news programmes, which are so valued. Uh, and putting it into diversity funding, I just don't think it reflects um, the, the nature of our whole UK. But the fundamental issue to me is not that, though I have concerns about that. The fundamental issue is just whether it can possibly be right in the modern day and age to force people by threat of prosecution to pay for a media service when there is so much choice available to them uh, on threat of, of prosecution. I do not see how that is viable. Uh, and more and more people we're seeing are not uh, watching BBC content are choosing to avoid that, to cancel their licence fee. And in the long term, that's going to cause a real challenge. I think the BBC should be, um, as, as um, Philip has already said, changed to a subscription model. I think it should be about choice and those quality programmes, the, the, the dramas and things that people really love to watch. 
uh, we'll still compete out there in an international setting and we'll bring in uh, money to, to fund those things. Um, maybe there's a discussion to be had about government uh, being involved in supporting the world service or supporting those local and regional connections that we value and we want to continue to deliver. But fundamentally, I don't see how the current model survives through the next you know, five to 10 years through to the, the, um, the end of the current agreement in 2027. Thank you, Ben. Uh, Duncan. Lovely. Well, thank you, thank you, Martin. I mean, I'd echo many of the many of the points that both Ben and uh, Ben and Philip have made. I mean, it's long been our long been our view at the Taxpayers Alliance that uh, the BBC should indeed move to a subscription-based model, whereby it's an entirely voluntary voluntary charge in which those who actually want to watch the service are are, are willing to pay for it. Um, in addition to that, of course, we think that. Um, you know, non-payment should no longer be a criminal offence. It should be decriminalised entirely, and it should be removed from the from the magistrates' court system. And you know, those who don't don't pay the BBC licence fee shouldn't ever um, have a threat of a custodial sentence. Um, but you know, we've got we've got real qualms about the the licence fee for for several reasons. Uh, one of which is that it's it's fundamentally anachronistic. I think it was first introduced in 1904, or at least a version thereof. I think it was the Wireless Telegraphy Act. I think it was that was formalised in the mid 1920s. Obviously, it stayed in place in the in the 30s when the BBC started. Um, introducing uh, uh, television, so you know it's fundamentally outdated. Um, there's also wider impacts in in other areas of the state as well. I mean, the Magistrates Association, for example, I think they've been campaigning for this for over 20 years now to to do decriminalise non-payment of the licence fee because it has it has real impact within the court system. I mean, obviously there's variation year to year, but around about one in ten uh, cases before a magistrate um, is is for non-payment of the licence fee. And again, it's a relatively small number, but there are still people who are facing relatively short, or indeed very short. Um, custodial sentences potentially for for non-payment of the license fee and obviously if it functions effectively like a, any other utility I think that's 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 fundamentally wrong um, it's also very regressive I mean it, the impact as with many other forms of indirect taxation falls most most heavily on poorer households um, and women and you know obviously our, our, our fundamental concern as with many other public sector organizations is that the BBC is not a very good arbiter of uh, taxpayers cash I mean you know we published our BBC license fee on a couple of a couple of weeks ago and that showed the you know the real excess um, at the top of the BBC um, after years years and years of you know saying that they'll sort of clamp down on some of the success we're still finding these um, absurd examples just spending a few minutes coming through their accounts is um, infuriating so looking to the future um, what should be done um, as I said I mean you know it's, it's very good news that the government seemingly is moving towards a position of decriminalization but let's you know let's 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 see that formalized um, it, but in order to move to a subscription model it's very important that the public service broadcasting obligations have to be disposed of so Tony Hall the former head of the BBC um, alluded to this in a speech a couple of years back, and he said that with the public sector, sub public service broadcasting obligations, that essentially means that they have to produce a certain amount of content for news and um, you know, international programming and so on and so forth. That's quite a heavy burden um, to have relative to other competitors, a la Netflix and Amazon, who can produce whatever they like. So in order for the BBC to do that, Tony Hall is correct that they should have absolute freedom to produce whatever they want. There should be no obligation. That applies to other public service broadcasters, such as Channel 4, ITN and, and, and Channel 5 too corporation out of the out of the BBC um, there's no reason why that can't be um, privatized I mean the 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 channel I mean the functions with um, primarily through advertising revenue so there's no reason why that can't be fully uh, moved off the government book um, I think the I think the net assets are something like 400 million pounds obviously it spends a huge amount on on creative content um, I think retained earnings are a similar number so there's you know there's a good cash pile potentially for the uh, for the government to um, uh, release uh, release into the private sector so those are those that's our broad position so definitely move to a full subscription model um, but with uh, decriminalization and the uh, ending of the public service broadcasting obligations. Thank you very much. And John. Um, thank you. Um, well, I've been attending party conferences for a very long time, and I think I've debated the BBC at party conference, I think every year for about the last 15 years. And I always enjoy doing it because to the rest of the world, I'm branded an enemy of the BBC who wants to sort of destroy it. And actually, this is the one opportunity I have to demonstrate that actually I support the BBC. That is not to say it isn't uh, needing considerable change, but I do think the BBC still has a very important role in the broadcasting landscape. Now, the world is changing very quickly. We are seeing streaming services entering the market. So you now have Amazon and Disney and Netflix and Apple. Um, and so the choice available to viewers is much greater. And obviously the BBC and other public service broadcasters will need to adapt to that new world. 
But I still think that there is a need for public service broadcasting. Firstly, to fill the gaps in the market which are not being uh, supplied by the um, streaming services and the more commercial broadcasters. Um, that's going to be predominantly things like news and current affairs, education, arts programming, some high quality UK originated drama. Um, and the other role that they play is supporting creative industries. I mean, we have an incredibly successful creative industry, industry sector, but it is British broadcasters who overwhelmingly support that by commissioning content from across the country. Now, I completely accept that the BBC is not perfect. Indeed, I have a number of criticisms that I make, and some of them Ben has rightly articulated. Um, I'm not happy sometimes about the extent to which they are properly reflecting the whole of Britain rather than appearing to be dominated by um, a London-centric or metropolitan view of Britain. Um, I think they are also um, too large, and that is something which the new Director General has recognised and said that he will be reducing the overall size. I think the BBC needs to concentrate more on doing what it needs to do better and not trying to address every market where uh, in some cases it's already well supplied. So there are definitely the needs to be changed and I very much welcome Tim Davies' commitment to that. But the one thing which I would counter is, is I think everybody on this panel has said we should move to subscription. There is a real problem. Although streaming services are increasing in terms of viewership, the majority of people still get television by linear TV. That means that they watch it through their aerials, through Freeview. And there is no way in which you can introduce a subscription service on Freeview. The reason you can subscribe to Netflix and HBO and Disney and Amazon is because you get them online where it is very easy to have a subscription model. On Freeview, there is no mechanism for turning off a channel if you don't want to watch it. Um, and obviously, if you move to a subscription model, you have to have the ability not to watch if that is your choice in order if you want not to pay. So there may come a time one day where we could have subscription, but it requires everybody to have broadband connections capable of receiving or live TV streaming, and also to choose to pay for it. And there are a large number of people who don't either because broadband is not of sufficient quality yet, although that is something this government, I hope, is going to put right soon. But then you've got the people who don't want to pay £30 a month or thereabouts for a broadband connection. That, of course, is before they even start to have to pay for the subscription services. So there is a technological challenge which at the moment makes subscription impossible to do. And I share the view that the license fee has many faults. I've been fiercely critical. It is regressive. Um, and I hope one day we will reach a position where we can find an alternative means of funding the BBC. But I have to say that we are not there yet. Um, I think by the time that this charter, and I wrote the last charter, by the time this charter um, expires in 2027, we will be approaching it. I don't think the licence fee will survive in the longer term. But for the moment, it is an imperfect, but probably the best available means of paying for the BBC. Thank you very much. So um, to kick off questions, I'll, 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 uh, uh, I'll kick them off. Uh, John, you said the BBC is not perfect, but just to get uh, back to the uh, original point, BBC controls 70% of news output on British TV and radio. Um, that's an extraordinary figure for a state-controlled body uh, to, 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 to be controlling. Philip, you want to know that uh, there's a long history of governments and the establishment restricting broadcasting uh, and government's explicit objective of centralizing control of broadcasting. Is there something fundamentally wrong with a state-funded body controlling public discourse to that extent? Yeah, that worries me greatly. Obviously, all um, media outlets have their biases, and unless you present news in a highly factual way, which I must say, I think BBC World Service does much better than um, the BBC that we watch on our tend to watch on our channels uh, at, at home, and certainly better than um, the BBC when it's presenting, say, documentaries and so on, which often have uh, framing uh, biases. I, I think the World Service is much more neutral in the way it presents 
um, both information uh, and and news. But I, yeah, there, there is something I think greatly problematic about the state in effect controlling so much um, uh, news output. It's not that the state or the government of the day will directly control uh, what is produced. It's just that institutions which are um, a part of the state tend to develop their own particular characteristics and biases. And this comes out in programming. And when you control uh, so much of the market, uh, this then leads to a, a, a bias in the market as a whole. It wouldn't be allowed in, um, if Rupert Murdoch uh, had such a control uh, of the market um, or, or if some other private uh, entity uh, had so much control. So when it comes to newspapers, no, there's lots of choice. We accept that newspapers have different biases. We can either buy the newspaper which reflects our own biases or we can uh, discount those biases when we read other newspapers. And it includes, of course, um, uh, newspapers such as The Guardian, which are owned by charitable uh, uh, trusts, as well as uh, newspapers which are um, uh, owned on commercial terms. So, yeah, I think this is really problematic. And if the BBC carries on in anything like its current form, I think it should be subject to the same competition rules uh, that uh, all other broadcasters and provider of, uh, uh, providers of content are subject to. Um, let me bat that over to you, John. Um, uh, uh, Philip mentioned buying a newspaper. If you went up to a newsstand and you said, well, can I have a copy of the Daily Telegraph, please? And they said, you can only buy any of these newspapers if you first spend a pound buying Pravda, um, and then, which, take it from us, is unbiased. I guess that you'd tell them something rude, um, and you'd probably say, it's up to me to decide whether what you've got to sell is biased, um, not you. And furthermore, you might be actually after something that's biased, like the Daily Telegraph or the Guardian. Um, why does why does one rule apply for broadcasting and another for newspapers? Well, I think it's a completely false analogy. Um, the first thing I'd say is that there is choice on news on TV. I mean, obviously, as well as the BBC, you have the ITN and you have Sky. And then, if you really want, you know, there is RT, there's CGTN, there's Al Jazeera, there's C. Uh, NBC and CNN. Now, you know, the BBC does have the overwhelming share of the market, but that is because in the main, people trust it um, and it reports British news quite well. Now, I am not, again, going to say BBC doesn't occasionally annoy me, but one of the things that UK broadcasters are required to be under the terms of their broadcasting licence is impartial. Um, and if you don't like it, then you make a complaint. And I can assure you that you know, many people do, and including myself in some instances. But there is a requirement. It's in the top line of the public services, of the uh, public purposes of the BBC for impartiality. Um, and you, know, you will not find that on RT or on CGTN or the others. But the other thing to say is that people get their news from a variety of sources. And actually, the place where most people are now turning to for their news is the big social media platforms. Um, and actually, if there is a difficulty around over-dominance in the supply of news, it isn't on TV. It is through Google and Facebook, which are very dominant, and it is where more and more people are turning to uh, in order to access news content. And that is something which um, is of considerable concern to me and the government and which we are looking at. Um, Duncan, let me let me back some of that over to you. Um, uh, John says there is choice in news, uh, but is that how it works from with your economist hat on? I mean, if the BBC has vastly greater resources than other news providers and is able to hire, you know, our, our man in Washington and our woman in uh, Dubai and so on and so forth, then presumably other um, uh, arrivals will struggle to compete with that. I mean, I know myself that if something's happened in the world and I want to know what happened, I'll go to the BBC because I know they've got people all over the place in a way that ITN cannot afford. Is it a genuine choice that we have? I, I mean, their, their position is, is, is hugely dominant internationally. I bet, you know, it's also important to dwell on how that's impacted the local media landscape over over many years. I mean, obviously, I think there were plans at some stage to introduce sort of local TV stations by the BBC about you know, 10, 15 years ago. I think it was obviously their, their share of local radio is enormous. I mean, they're you know, I think in excess of 30 local radio stations across England, uh, Wales and Scotland. So that, that that's sort of one element. And of course, the secondary effect of this is is um, print media, too. Obviously, you know, there's still numerous free, uh, free sheets rather around the around the country. But, you know, ultimately, the, the, the presentation of choice is somewhat illusory in some elements, some elements of the market. Um, I mean, one one concern, though, you know, the idea that 
the BBC sort of fills gaps in the market. Um, I mean, that's I, I'm not not quite sure about that element. And I'm, I mean, ultimately, a lot of the creative industries in the UK have already got a particularly you know uh, advantageous position. You know, for example, George Osborne introduced this sort of film tax credit um, years ago to a, you know lure some Hollywood producers over to, to Pinewood Studios. You know, it's already a, um, a, a wonderfully well uh, well catered for industry um, by um, by the Treasury in the first place. So I think the idea that the BBC is you know there to sort of present some of some of the best elements of high culture um, is is. Is, is slightly bogus, um, but you know, let's ultimately let's not forget the impacts that the BBC really has across lots of different areas of the media landscape, which don't get that much attention. But um, yeah, that's that's important to, to to dwell on that too. Ben, let me uh, ask you about bias. You said that um, uh, you you thought that no one at BBC is deliberately biased. I remember giving a talk at the Sheffield um, Television Festival. There was a crucible theatre, three hundred people there, and I thought I'll ask people what they what they read. And I thought this is going to be rather clever of me because, of course, most people put their hands up for Guardian. So I went through the newspapers and, in fact, everybody put their hand up for Guardian. 300 people put their hand up for Guardian. No one put their hand up for anything else. Um, having worked in TV for uh, uh, decades, um, I know that the industry is populated by uh, the, the, uh, the, the uh, British uh, posh anti-capitalist intelligentsia. So I know very well what the biases are. Do you think the BBC is beautifully impartial, as John as John argued? I just think it's it's almost impossible to be impartial in this day and age, where you've got, particularly in a Twitter world, where you're asked for as a BBC journalist for your view every thirty seconds of every day. How can you possibly get through that without showing any political uh, leaning? It's impossible. Um, but I think you're right. The point is, it's not. Um, I'm sure there are some, but for the vast vast majority, it's not a case of deliberately trying to misrepresent or seek bias but it's it's as you said they all read the guardian they're all from the same um kind of uh, social space from the same kind of um thought process and and positioning all kind of middle class metropolitan type backgrounds um and when they do focus on that diversity and and put effort into that it's about physical characteristics rather than diversity of thought or diversity of um geography uh, and that is hugely frustrating i know John said the BBC is trusted, and I'm sure that's still true, but certainly my experience in my constituency is a huge decline in that trust. We reached a point um, in the election and through the start of coronavirus where we were doing the daily briefings and the questions from journalists got so frustrating that actually politicians were more trusted in the polls at one point than, than journalists were, which is madness. Um, it's never, never happened before, but you had BBC journalists questioning, you know, what have we done to contribute to this such an appalling level of trust? In, in UK journalism. Um, John mentioned that it kind of fills, fills gaps in the market. And I think that used to be true. I feel like now it creates some false needs as well. And we've seen um, things like new BBC Scotland channels, for example, with just a handful of viewers that are taxpayer funded. And it's kind of been created to keep, um, keep the gnats at bay, it seems. But um, without really that, that market testing and that real need for, for gap filling, so to speak, and those gaps where it used to fill in terms of things like um, you know, provision with sign language or subtitles and things like that are, are readily available on all sorts of other ch um, channels now. There are specific channels for, um, you know, for those kind of bits of, of content as well for people who might have struggled to access it. So uh, I'm not sure that uh, I agree with that anymore. Certainly, I think that's a declining market in terms of filling some of those gaps. Can I just say something, Martin, about the, the issue of filling gaps? No. Uh, um, economists don't like anecdotes, but then the rest of the world says economists aren't sufficiently human. So I'm going to use a, a, a couple of anecdotes. Um, I mean, my, my wife these days, she, she watches an incredible amount of art stuff. And nearly all of that now is um, uh, online, YouTube, uh, and, and other types of, of content. Almost none uh, is on mainstream television, uh, and certainly not the BBC. I watch quite a few history documentaries and, and uh, other related things. And I certainly watch more on Smithsonian Freeview than I do um, BBC. And, uh, and I think the provision actually is very poor when it comes to the BBC. But if you do have a real problem here, if you do need, if there is some cultural gap which needs to be uh, filled, whatever we might think about the mechanism and whether the Arts Council and uh, uh, other forms of government funding uh, exist, uh, it should be open for broadcasters, all broadcasters, not just the BBC, to tap into sources of government funding which fill particular artistic um, education, educational or, or cultural needs. In fact, the BBC already produces programmes with the Open University. That type of thing, I think, 
uh, is to be encouraged rather than uh, discouraged. So I think the gaps in the market are now very small, and there are better mechanisms for filling those gaps in the market, which would put broadcasting and uh, other forms of content provision on, on a level playing field with uh, um, other players in the world of arts, culture and media and so on, because you could no longer put brick walls between them and treat them all differently. Yes, now on, on, on the subject of gaps, I remember making a wonderful series with Brian Sewell, making the pilgrimage to Santiago de Compostela, which went out on Channel 5 and was one of the highest rating uh, programmes in the, in the slot historically for Channel 5. Um, Brian Sewell, who was untouchable by the BBC, but then like him because he was a bit too right wing. Um, can I ask all of you about the relationship between the BBC and Conservatives? It was under Conservative government that the BBC was uh, founded. Um, and at the time, uh, the, the new exciting radio that was sort of um, uh, exploding in America, with lots of different radio stations popping up in America, the British establishment was very nervous that you know, the oiks would find their voice and they would be, you know, they needed to control this new mass form of communication. Uh, do you think, and I'm going to start with you, Ben, here, because there's a certain kind of class issue here as a, a head of the Blue Collar Conservatives. Do you think that the posh Conservative Party of those years uh, actually just feared freedom of thought, feared the idea that there would be a mass form of communication that would have to appeal to the masses uh, and that the ruling establishment would, would lose control? I don't know about that. I, I think there the, was certainly and has historically been a need for um, some kind of, of way of getting messages across. If we had a, a crisis like COVID going back in the 40s and 50s, you'd struggle for um, platforms and, and ways to get that message across it effectively. And, and I could see, um, you know, why we would need to, to fund that kind of thing. But I mean, to, to set the record straight, I'm not anti-BBC. I'd like it to succeed. I'd just like it to be very, very different. Um, I think, you know, I, I love some of the dramas, some of the crime drama in particular that we tend to pick up on Netflix these days. Um, I, and I think I'd like it to compete more in terms of um, being able to, to bid for things like sport that has obviously huge viewership um, and the soft power that the BBC has in the World Service, um, you know, regional news, I think is really important. So I'd like it to do well, but I think it keeps shooting itself in the foot. Um, and, and I think it, in order to um, be able to stick to the things that are positive and that are competitive. It needs to be kind of let free uh, to compete in that market and the market will um, effectively decide which of those things uh, are not helpful or are um, causing, causing themselves problems. When it um, continues to come out with um, even some of the, we've had lots of discussion in recent months about the BBC comedy and whether that's left wing. We've seen some pretty awful examples um, of, of comedy from a, a left perspective or identity politics perspective that just would not be acceptable. Um, the, the killing YT thing on, on Frankie Boyle's programme a few weeks ago where, you know, tell me, uh, I challenge you to come up with a, any other ethnic group where that would be acceptable the other way around. And it's absolutely appalling to viewers uh, around the country. But countless BBC producers have been and watched that and seen it and obviously not batted an eyelid and thought it was appropriate to put out. So uh, I just think there are many, many ways because it is propped up and because they don't have to compete that the BBC continues to shoot itself in the foot. What I would like um, is for it to be able to do a great job at the things that it is good at and to have that level of trust as a, a respected British institution. I think that's important. Um, but as it stands, I don't think it's possible. Duncan, um, can I ask you, should we be worried and should um, Lawrence Fox be gaining a lot of sucker from this conversation. Here we have the Conservative Party, supposedly the party of free enterprise, and we have John, the magnificent John and Ben, and they're both singing the praises saying, oh, well, if only they could do a little bit better for um, a large state broadcaster. Uh, do, is there a problem that in politics there is no party that properly represents a love of freedom and free markets? I, I I I think there's a lot of truth to that. To be honest, I, I think the I'm not sure the BBC necessarily either now or in the past sort of represents you know a deeply sort of snobbish or authoritarian streak within the within the Conservative Party. I think a lot of the changes that the BBC went through in sort of the, the mid to late sixties with that was the week that was and beyond the fringe. You know, quite a few quite a few of the people who are employed at least partially by the BBC sort of really pushed the envelope of um, satire and sort of you know. Push that through quite a bit, um, but I, I think you're right. It's it's a relatively it's a relatively limited and small um, position at the moment, at least in the Conservative Party or elsewhere, who have you know real qualms about the ability of the BBC to have a you know fully independent 
um, fully independent force way of doing their doing their work without recourse to the, you know back, uh, um, uh, having sort of full backing from the state overall. Um, how we move to that, as I said, is important to go through quite a few changes. We're getting rid of public service broadcasting obligations in the in the first place. Um, but but yes, fundamentally, I think that's I think that's a very fair point. I mean, it, it is very jarring to be sort of outwardly pro freedom, and yet on the on the other hand, sort of maintain a, a very large monopoly is, as you say, sort of around about seventy percent market share from a, a lot a lot of news output in the UK. So uh, we've a long way to go, but um, yeah, it doesn't seem to fit entirely easily within the Conservative Party at the moment. That position, Martin. John, let me let me put it to you. Your 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 you, you the, the light is behind you, so we can't see your face too well. So I don't know whether you we won't notice if you blush. But um, can I ask you? You say that the you know, the BBC has a duty to be impartial. Um, do you think the BBC was impartial when it came to Brexit? Well, um, in terms of whether or not the BBC is partisan, I don't think the BBC is Labour supporting or Conservative supporting. I mean, I know a lot of people both who are BBC journalists and who are in BBC management, who actually have a history of activism in the Conservative Party, and I think may well still vote Conservative, but they are extremely professional and they don't reveal that publicly. Where I am critical, and Ben touched on this in his contribution, and I agree with it strongly, is, is that the BBC has failed to properly understand and reflect the views of a large part of Britain, um, and the Brexit referendum was a very good demonstration of that. Um, I was a Brexit supporter, um, but if you turned on the, I'm not, it wasn't just the BBC, but on most of the news broadcasters, Brexit supporters were regarded as a sort of rather eccentric, out of touch, little Englanders. Um, and I think you only had to see the results programmes to see the absolute shock when it came out that the majority of people in the UK were going to vote in favour of leaving the European Union. And, and that wasn't because necessarily they were biased, it was because they didn't properly understand and reflect parts of those parts of Britain which did turn out to support Brexit, particularly in the north of England. Um, again, in the last general election, the BBC and other broadcasters, I don't think... Um, anticipated what was happening in those red wall seats across the north of England. It came as a complete shock when we started seeing seats like Blythe Valley electing a Conservative Member of Parliament. And that is a problem for the BBC. And the only um, consolation is that it is one that first Tony Hall and now particularly Tim Davy has recognised. Uh, and they are going to need to address because the BBC should reflect all of Britain um, in order to provide proper news coverage. Um, and I think they have a great deal of work to do that. Um, as you say, uh, bias is not just about simple party political bias. It operates in a very, very subtle way because people are talking about human affairs and how can, we, how can one be unbiased when talking about something enormously complex like human affairs. Um, John says it's a problem for the BBC, but is it a problem actually for the rest of us? Philip, you've written about how uh, the BBC is able to exert an enormous control, for example, over education. They offer free services in education, providing free educational uh, materials, which obviously compete with commercial organisations that have to pay for those things. So they, they, can you describe how something like that effectively muscles out? And also what the effect is of a BBC, which, for example, refuses to accept anything to do with global warming, scepticism, for example, affecting the children, uh, uh, the, the education of my children. Um, yeah, so I, I, I'm probably an outlier on this panel, actually, because I didn't support Brexit. Uh, and um, probably, uh, no, as compared with you, Martin, I'm, I'm uh, content to accept the uh, sort of scientific consensus, if you like, in relation to global warming as well. So I, I, I probably speak with a, a, some neutrality on, on, on these um, uh, things. And, and um, I mean, there, there is a particular set of views which is generally left-leaning and social democratic, but al also, particularly in relation to recent debates, really becomes ex uh, quite extreme, anti-capitalistic, anti-family, um, and, and so on, which is extremely well represented in higher education, uh, in broadcasting, and um, in the arts. And I don't think B the BBC is especially different from other organizations. So my, and um, 
my, so my argument isn't really that the BBC is more biased than, than other broadcasters or other providers of uh, uh, art and culture material, simply that we should be uh, free to uh, choose whether or not we subscribe to an organisation which is bound to have these kinds of uh, cultural biases. And if you, if you really want to overcome them as, as a professional um, editor, you know, if let's say you're researching a programme on uh, the food programme, say on Radio 4, where there was a particularly bad example, I, I think, recently of um, a presentation of a set of ideas which suggested that if, if we all grew food in our own back gardens, I'm exaggerating slightly, uh, we'd all be much better off and we'd be able to deal with pandemics better and all the rest of it, uh, which you know, anybody who knows anything at all about the economics of uh, food production will know is a ridiculous set of arguments. Now, um, the, the various academics and others that the producer spoke to or the, or the presenter spoke to, um, as far as the producer was, uh, was concerned, probably represented the consensus and the only set of reasonable perspectives on this question. Now, and if you're a professional editor, you, you have to dig deep, you, um, and especially if many of the experts, especially in higher education, are of the, the same perspective. You have to dig deep to find alternative views and critiques. And I just don't think that happens. I don't think, by and large, people who work in this field um, are sufficiently self-aware um, to be able uh, to, um, to do that. Now, those cultures can change. It wasn't very long ago that the BBC and other media organisations were incredibly culturally conservative and culturally socially conservative. Indeed, that's one of the reasons why the BBC survived without competition, because people feared that other organisations coming in might uh, undermine that cultural uh, conservatism. So that can change. I just think these organisations ought, uh, 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 ought, ought to be free to develop their own cultures and it just makes things even worse and is also not a uh, tenable ethical position when people are forced to pay for um, things with uh, which they don't agree and that they don't want to watch when they can find better things elsewhere. Um, a couple of questions for our, for our politicians. Um, the BBC obviously has something up its sleeve which it, it can sort of make the odd surprisingly few given that it employs 35,000 pounds, uh, 30, 35,000 people. Um, surprisingly few great shows in my opinion, but nevertheless, um, it creates Dad's army and faulty towers and so on and so forth. In a discussion about the BBC, is it difficult that, in a sense, people associate the BBC with those things that they love? And so the BBC has be able, been able to buy uh, affection in that way, and you're considered very mean if you say something against the BBC. And indeed, because of its monopoly control, I insist, over um, uh, broadcasting news, are politicians scared of tackling the BBC. John? No, I don't think so. I mean, I note that your examples are much like programmes are now 30 to 40 years ago. Um, I would say that the BBC, BBC is still producing some really great programmes, um, as are many other broadcasters. But, but you know, I can think of things like the Salisbury Poisonings or the Dracula adaptation or the trial of Christine Keeler or... Um, there is every week there is still great content on the BBC. A lot of our concern is around the news coverage and bias. And as I say, I do think that they have a job to do that. The other thing, which is which the, the title of this um, discussion today uh, was BBC and C4, what makes them state broadcasters. And we seem to have spent the entire time talking about the BBC. I do think there is the very important debate to be had about Channel 4, because unlike the BBC, Channel 4 survives without any taxpayer funding as an advertising uh, funded model. And with the advent of the streamers and um, other uh, competing services, that model is under increasing strain. Uh, and I'm not sure it is sustainable into the future. And so we do need to think about Channel 4 and whether or not there is still a need for a second owned public service, publicly owned uh, PSB, or what function it should fulfill. Um, and that's something that we are giving a lot of thought to. Right, quickly, uh, Ben, are, are politicians scared of the BBC? John's a minister, so he's got to my what he says, but you can hopefully be a bit more honest. Oh, you're muted. Ben, you're muted. My dog was going mental in the background, so I thought I'd best <laughs> But um, yeah, I think um, I don't think they are. And I think increasingly, particularly post 2019 election, we've seen MPs coming into Parliament from different parts of the country, from different demographics who are perhaps um, more critical, perhaps more aware because of the parts of the country that they come from, that those views are not reflective of their part of the world. 
um, a more diverse range of thought within the Conservative Party as well, I think, um, which probably is healthy. And I think we've seen more of a kind of a backlash from Conservative politicians in particular um, about some of these BBC related challenges. John mentioned Channel 4, and one of the people I think has been overtly biased, in my view, is, is Christian Guri Murphy and some of the, the Channel 4 News um, type folks who I think have, have done it absolutely deliberately. And I've been skewered by them more than once where you're not able to get a word in before um, everybody's been slated. Um, you know, so there is a real question there um, about what to do with individuals and public service broadcasters who do this as well. We've seen, um, you know, the, the new um, director of BBC saying, you know, that there will be consequences for those kind of events, uh, those kind of outbursts and, and yet to see any. I hope that, that he will follow through with that. Um, so there's a real challenge there. But I don't think that Conservative MPs in particular now, post-2019 direction, are scared of these these broadcasters. I think our constituents are, are increasingly critical of them, actually. Um, uh, so, Ben, you remind us that um, uh, uh, Channel 4 um, uh, um, is, uh, you know, is not supported by the licence fee, but it's still got its own you know, particular skew and agenda. Duncan, can I ask you, is it enough to change the BBC from a licence fee paying model to um, subscription? Because obviously they would start, uh, uh, Philip once wrote that the BBC would begin with considerable monopoly power, whatever the next phase it is of its existence. It obviously has a huge advantage um, against um, uh, uh, private competitors because it's begun as this gigantically well-funded monolith, monolith. And likewise, Channel 4, you know, we set up with ITV money. So it's not really fair that these start as enormously well-established organisations. Is there something wrong there? I, I think there's, there's an obvious inbuilt advantage at the moment. I think if you look the, through their accounts last year, I think the revenue from the licence through is about 3.5, 3.6 billion pounds. Uh, from the get-go, so clearly that's 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 um, a huge thing to leverage from the get-go. Um, one thing I'd be slightly wary about, though, is you know for us or for me or Taxpayers Alliance or anyone else to kind of define exactly what the content of the BBC and Channel Four should be in the future. I mean, ultimately, if we were indeed to move to a subscription model, and obviously John sort of laid out some of the concerns about the technological challenges to to implement that, but I think that's certainly certainly viable in the next in the next couple of years. Um, you know, if it is the case that the BBC is staffed by overwhelmingly left-wing people who live in Islington and Hackney, and that's coming through um, with the content that's produced, then ultimately people are going to be quite irritated with that content. And I think, you know, as Ben has laid out, um, John too, and quite a few of us, you know, there is not the kind of geographical diversity at the top of the BBC, indeed across across all of the ranks. And I think that kind of concern isn't merely mirrored between us. I think a lot, a lot of people across the UK will, will sense that too. So ultimately, if it is subjected to the normal market forces and they want to continue producing this kind of content they do at the moment and that remains popular, then let's 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 see if that's really the case. So I'd be slightly slightly wary for for, for me to sort of editorialise that. Ultimately, that's for you know BBC producers to determine exactly what they want to be what they want to be doing in the future. But I think the the concerns about the BBC and how they go about selecting people for for those kind of roles at the at the top of the organisation is is um, is a growing concern. So um, yes, they've obviously got a huge advantage if they were to go fully private tomorrow morning. Um, but I think that would that would change pretty rapidly unless they adapted to um, the new forces which they're being compelled to compete with. Yeah, it's reasonable that the normal the normal rules of competition policy would apply. So no, the the BBC is, is actually an increasingly small part of the. Um, market as a whole, as, as we've been discussing, you know, the, the market has become much more broader, includes uh, lots of um, forms of content provision, and the market for news includes newspapers as well. So the, mar the, the market is, is, is very broad, and the BBC in these some many areas may actually uh, only have a small proportion of the total market. It's only if you define it as television that the uh, BBC's dominance uh, becomes uh, uh, very significant. But what the competition authorities surely mustn't allow is cross subsidization using one area where the BBC can, because of its uh, standing advantages, be very profitable uh, to provide free stuff which undermines the private sector in other areas. So you mentioned the provision of educational uh, materials, uh, Martin. Some people may think this is a great idea, um, but if you work for Pearson's uh, and you're producing those educational materials and you actually have to charge people uh, for them and the BBC is cross subsidizing it using licensed payers' um, uh, money, then it's really not uh, such a good idea. It suppresses competition and suppresses innovation. So I think the normal competition rules simply apply to the BBC um, if it moves to a subscriber owned model uh, as they would to any other provider of uh, uh, content, educational materials, cultural materials and broadcasting. 
I'm going to ask you all a, all a question, and now if you could sort of interrupt each other and insult each other and think like that, that would be really good for the final phase. Um, uh, that the, 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 uh, Boris Johnson is talking about shoving uh, Charles Moore in as head of the BBC. Is that really going to make any difference? You know, 35,000 people working at the BBC, changing one person at the top, you know, you can, I'm thinking in my mind, suppose you present, you've got British Leyland, and then you think, don't worry, we'll put Philip Booth in charge of it, and it'll be all right. You know, it's, it does one person, can one person um, herd cats that, that, that well? I think he's withdrawn, Martin, has he not? He, he has withdrawn. I mean, but, but oh, that's right. right. Charles has said he, he won't be putting his name forward. There is oh, a process, um, and I'm no doubt we will get quite a large number of applicants, um, and we will try and find somebody who does understand the challenges that the BBC face. But actually, in some ways, the more important role is that of the Director General, because it's the DG who is Editor-in-Chief and who has uh, the day-to-day -day running of the BBC. The board only sets a strategic direction. And actually, I am encouraged by um, the comments that the new Director General has made so far. I mean, his first action was to restore Rule Britannia to... Uh, the BBC's coverage of last night of the proms, which you know clearly was something the public overwhelmingly wanted to see. Uh, but he's also recognised that there is a lot of work to do mm -hmm. to address the uh, perception of bias. To um, and Ben mentioned Twitter. Uh, one of the things that Tim Davy has done is said that BBC journalists will no longer be allowed to have social media feeds, and I think that that is a a sensible move because I think it does question their impartiality, particularly. Uh, given some of the comments that have been made by BBC journalists on Twitter in the past. You've picked up a bigger issue there, though, Martin, that, that, you know, where things are not subject to competition, um, are they truly representative? Do they truly work in the kind of public interest? Um, you know, in media, it's not just the BBC that has problems and bias and leaning. The point is more that BBC is the only one that we pay for um, directly. And, and it's the same across public institutions, though. You say, can you introduce one person who can make a massive fundamental change? Um, the answer to me is no, because the problem is not the BBC. The problem is our institutions, our system of government. The problem is that um, none of those or, or many of those institutions are very London centric, very metropolitan. Uh, and therefore recruit from a very London-centric metropolitan um, kind of group of, of potential staff and are increasingly out of touch with the country. I think there's a, uh, a fundamental overhaul of public services and institutions that's needed while we have this government majority. Um, if we're going to make sure that our, our public services and the people who run them actually are reflected of the people who use them. Yeah, but will it ever, can it ever, on the question of bias, I mean, you know, you're, you're quite right, Ben, that, uh, you know, when we don't complain that The Guardian is biased, we don't complain that The Daily Mail is biased, we are free to buy one or not buy one. Um, uh, John, do you not, are you not stung by the, you know, the, the, the point that we should decide for ourselves whether we're going to uh, pay for, 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 this, uh, for this service, and we shouldn't be told we have to. Well, I, I think I've, I've, I've tried to explain why that, that, that is simply not possible at the moment. Because, you, because in order to choose whether or not to buy something, you have to have the ability to turn it off to those people who don't want to pay for it. And we don't have that ability at the moment. It may come one day, but at the moment it doesn't exist. And so unless you say that the BBC is only available through a streaming online service, in which case you will be cutting off a huge number of the population from being able to get the BBC. We are not there yet. And it is the fact that Unless there is no... adverts. Well, if you bring adverts on the BBC, the first thing you will almost certainly do is destroy ITV. The, the, the market isn't there. We've just seen a 40% drop in advertising spend as a result of the COVID crisis. But even before that, you know, if you go and ask... The so we need the BBC area, in order to save commercial broadcasting? This is getting no, started. I mean, we have a model whereby you have three different methods of funding. You have the BBC paid for by a licence fee. You have ITV and other commercial broadcasters paid for by... Um, advertising, and then you have services that are available either online or through satellite, for which there is a subscription, because on satellite and online, you can turn them we're off. Sorry, I'm going to interrupt, John, sorry, because we're nearly out of time. I just want to ask you all, is, are the public doing the Tories' job for them? 250,000 people turned off from the licence fee this year. Only old people are watching, and old people vote Brexit, which suggests that the BBC aren't very good at convincing people. Um, uh, is this just going to happen? Philip, 
Duncan. Well, it, yes, it, I'm afraid it will happen unless we have a new system of funding which also liberates the BBC. Peacock explained in 1986 how the technology existed um, uh, then, or at least in the foreseeable future from, from uh, then, as to how we could um, move forward and, and ensure that we could choose whether or not to watch and pay for the BBC. That's before we could envisage conversations uh, like this on Zoom. And uh, yeah, it may not be possible to do it uh, tomorrow simply because of the way everything has been set up, but a roadmap can be set out such that in 2027, uh, we can move to a new um, um, uh, system, a new approach to funding uh, the BBC without question. I was just going to say to Philip, I, I completely agree. I've always said that the licence fee cannot survive in the longer term. And yes, we need to start thinking about the future. And actually one of the things that we're doing now is to consider the whole way in which our public service broadcasters function in what is a world that is already very different and is going to go on changing. So I'm completely with Philip about setting out the roadmap now. Duncan, are our events going to overtake this debate? I, I, I think I agree with both Philip and John there. I think it's definitely moving that in that kind of direction. I'm sure you'll see similar numbers this year and next year and the year after that of people sort of only with their feet and choosing not to choose not to pay for the licence fee anymore. Now, whether it's the case that Tim Davey really gets a hold of this and gets rid of you know, BBC Bite Size, for example, so as not to disadvantage companies like Pearson who are providing educational resources and they just sort of focus much more on terms of their, their sort of classical approach of delivering delivering news, um, that would be interesting to see. Um, if, they, if they do sort of grasp that, then I think um, you know people might... Uh, might be slightly more reticent to ditch the ditch the license fee, um, but at the moment, Martin, I think that trend is definitely going to continue, and I'd like to see what's going to be laid out by the by the time we get to the new uh, charter renewal in twenty twenty seven. Ben, the impressive figures: a quarter of a million viewers refusing to pay their license fee in the past year. Is this going to be you are the blue collar conservative? Is this a people's rebellion against the BBC uh, once again, we be putting our trust in the people rather than experts and politicians? Yeah, quite. I'm one of those 250,000, by the way. Um, I've, I've stopped um, subscribing myself. I think um, I think it's inevitable. And you mentioned, you know, older people increasingly make up more and more of the audience. Um, in my part of the world, it's those older people, as you say, that vote to leave are increasingly annoyed with the, the content from, from that perspective. Um, I think people will vote with their feet. And but as, uh, just because, frankly, it's not um, reasonable or sustainable to uh, expect people to fund um, media when there is just no need when there's so much other choice. But I think John um, is, is still saying it's inevitable uh, and we're all saying it's inevitable uh, but there are those practical barriers. It's only a matter of time before we have a better rollout of broadband services, before we have four or five G TV services where everybody will have the ability um, to get those um, you know, online services that you can switch on and off and at that point I think the license fee is, is dead in the water. Gentlemen, thank you so much. What a wonderful discussion. You are excellent <laughs> sports um, and uh, uh, have a good rest of the day. Goodbye, everyone. Thank, thank you. you.